All right, John is going to take us uh, through uh, the chapter in NTU right on worship. It's a great chapter, and he's got some handouts for us. So if you didn't get one of that, it's on the, on the desk, on the table. They'll just grab a handout, and uh, John is going to lead us. Thank you, John. Good morning. Uh, so I'm gonna, before I start with uh, what's on the handout, what we're going to talk about, I have a question for you. And that is, how many people in this room were raised Baptist? Two, three. And in my experience as a pastor and in working in various uh, situations in ministries, hospitals, etc., that's actually uh, about normal. You'd be surprised that when, that when you, if you stand in front of a Baptist church and you begin talking about things that you would think all Baptists would know, and you get complete blank stares, and that's because a third of the people there were raised Roman Catholic or Episcopalian or Lutheran or Methodist, and have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, and as time goes on, it becomes more and more uh, common for the majority of people in the church not to have been raised in that tradition. If I were to ask this same question in a Lutheran church, I would find that there were Roman Catholics, Methodists, Episcopalians, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question I'm going to ask you, uh, and, and there's a technical reason for it, right, which I don't expect you to know, but why do you think that is? Why do you think there's such mobility? For one church to, right. Trees keeping me honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I can take it from a Catholic perspective. Um, there are two ornamental pageantry, mm -hmm. all that staging kind of stuff. They do this very same thing. Mm -hmm. They actually think that they're turning the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Jesus. That, I, that's a misinterpretation. That's well, that's right. your... That's it, my thinking. That's your thinking, yes. Well, of course I can. Because I, I just want to say that... freedom in this country. I just, <laughs> just want to say... Just want to say about that. There are about two and a half billion Christians in, in the world... And about 2 billion actually believe in what's called the real presence. So we're actually in a tiny minority. <laughs> uh, but uh, you brought up a really good point, which we're going to end with, actually, which has to... I, I just wanted to yeah. say, see, I, I was an altar boy. Yeah. And so I was put, putting the... Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's real wine, actually. <laughs> so I was putting that in those little things uh, to pour... And uh, got it on my finger, tasted it, and I said, well, maybe that's why they like to drink that stuff. <laughs> but obviously, it's, I mean, he, at, you go to, well, you know, at the Last Supper, he was saying that it was my body and my blood. Or, no, he was saying, remember, remember. Well, this. That's, that's a whole other theological so, question, anyway, uh, question. That's why I left. But, to course, but it's a worship, but it is a worship issue. Go, right. go ahead. But to specifically address the question you ask about yeah. people's mobility, right. you know, a lot of American churchgoers have very sort of facile, simplistic concepts of the theology of any particular church that they go to. And so if you've, if you've not really absorbed a whole lot of theology then it doesn't make that much difference from, from one church to the next. And so you may go to sort of the church that's more convenient to you when you move, or, you know, maybe you go to a church where, you know, if your kids go to their preschool or, you know, sort of whatever right. other options they offer, rather than being particularly theolo theologically invested in going to, you know, sort of one strain versus another. 
Uh, just comment on that. You are exactly right, and we're going to build on that. That is the foundational issue. There are two others that that do build on that. Go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, I think there are some larger society or cultural uh, changes that have happened over the generations. Take a look at most people's family tree. Your descendants stayed in the same place, mm -hmm. generation after generation. When the, when the automobile came, everything changed. People became more mobile. They moved to where the jobs were. Their loyalty wasn't to their hometown or their family or their clan. Their loyalty was to the family that they were raising up. And so they followed the money. Mm -hmm. um, and so you couple all of that with the fact that, especially in America, um, we really value freedom uh, of, of will and freedom of choice. And you end up in the church of shopping. That's exactly right. So here's two. Here's, let me, let me put these. Go ahead. I was going to say, I married into it. I'd never been in the Baptist church. There you go. That's exactly what we've been talking about. So here's, here's how we bring these together. What's called denominational loyalty began to disappear in the 50s. And it began to disappear by virtue of relocation and movement and blended families. In a rural society, in small towns, people grow up there, they stay there, you marry the people you went to school with, and often they're the people you went to church with, and you go to that church, you were baptized in that church, your children will be baptized in that church, and your grandchildren will be baptized in that church. That all fell apart due to the mobility, mostly the post-war mobility. And so now there's a statistic that has a lot to do with worship, uh, there are two, and the first one is people go to church. Now, this is from the Fuller Church Growth Institute, which is surveys of thousands of people. Uh, people go to church within five miles of where they live. All right? So, yes, there's somebody who might drive 20 miles or 25 miles to go to church, or if you really like some mega church uh, like McLean, they will pull people in from all over, you know, and get 10,000 people. But the average church in America worships 80 people on a Sunday, almost all of whom live within five miles of where they live. And if they go to Parkwood Baptist Church, right, and you get a job say you work with the government, you get a job that takes you to the Maryland suburbs, and that's too far a commute, and so you move over there, you're going to change membership, most likely to within five miles of where you live. And secondly, people go to church where they feel comfortable, meaning they go into a church, and it may be a different kind of liturgy. It may be Lutheran, that is, has a fixed liturgy, and the people are friendly, and they like it, and they like the pastor, and now they're Lutheran. And what the, the, the reason behind that is because people don't know, as a general rule, in my experience, the theology of the church they were raised in. They just know the basics, like salvation by grace and grace alone. Well, that's taught by, by Baptist Pentecostals, Lutherans, Methodists, and now Roman Catholics after the what's called JDDJ. So you're going to get that anywhere, right? So what you're going to do is find a place that's comfortable. And one of the, the, the things that either makes you comfortable or uncomfortable is worship. How does worship occur? And many churches make, I'm going to say this just bluntly, many churches make a mistake in thinking, oh, we have to modernize our worship. We'll get all the young people or everybody will come if we do this. What happens, you lose about a third of your people. Because they were there because what? Why? They liked the way you did things, <laughs> right? 
and you don't get the others, by and large. You, nobody's going to leave their church and come to yours just because they heard you changed your worship service. Right? And that's not just me. That's a, you can look at the data in the studies. So let's get into NT right because there's other problems with, with why don't people worship? Why is it that people don't go to church? And I want to give you another statistic. Between 40 and 44% of the people in this country go to church regularly. And that hasn't changed in the last 35 years. So when you hear people say, well, the church is dead and people aren't worshiping and nobody goes to church anymore, you know what? It ain't true. However, what is true has been there's a dramatic shift in where people go to church. Mainline churches are some of them dying on the vine, and evangelical and Pentecostal churches and, and uh, non denominational churches are sometimes tripling in size right next door. Well, why? Did they, did they bring all these people in from the community who don't go to church? No, it's called sheep stealing. <laughs> That's the term pastors use. They got the people who were unhappy over here. All right? So what about worship? I want to start this section with, with a quote, which is the very first paragraph of, of chapter 11. When we begin to glimpse the reality of God, the natural reaction is to worship him. Not to have that reaction is a fairly sure sign that we haven't yet really understood who he is or what he's done. What Wright is starting out to say is this. We worship God as the reaction to our developing faith. When you really begin to understand God as the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, the person who has an impact on your life, the natural reaction is what? Worship. So if you don't have that, if you don't believe strongly in God, you don't have a great attachment to God, the consequence is you don't have a what? A great need to go and worship. It's a sometimes thing for a lot of people because if I get up on Sunday morning and feel like it, I'll go because I like it. These people are nice. I get along with them. It's a good service. But there is not that sort of push or desire. And so in the fourth and fifth chapters of Revelation, this again is... Um, uh, N.T. Wright, we glimpse the throne room of God. Here Wright insists we eavesdrop on the present. We're not talking about some future heaven here. We're talking about right now. And we are invited into the reality where God's sphere and ours interact. In religious studies of all kinds, including Christianity, there's the idea of what we call liminal spaces. And a liminal space is a thin place, right? That's where whatever realm or, or sphere or whatever you want to call it where God dwells in the spiritual realm and this one, the barrier is pretty thin. And so you can then both feel and glimpse what we call the numinous or sacred. Now, does that mean that a place by its very nature, a certain rock or hill or forest, is a liminal place? It's, no, it isn't. In, in our view, it's made liminal by what? What makes something a special place? How about a church where people have been worshiping, praying, lifting up their voices in song 
and been, and been down on their knees, baptized their children, got married, buried their dead for 400 years. It becomes what? Not tradition. It becomes a, a thin place, even in Christian spirituality, that the, the centuries of gathering there has made it a special place. Now, it is not like the temple that God dwells there, and he doesn't dwell other places. It just takes on the significance for people where people can what? More easily connect with God because of the associations of the place. So one of the things about worship is this building doesn't do anything to bring God in. What does? Right, but, but why is the Holy Spirit here? <laughs> the people and this, this association of worship, because the Holy Spirit is in each and every one of you. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit is what? Not given by measure, which means I don't have a little piece, you don't have a little piece, you don't have a little piece, tree. You don't have a little piece. It means I got the whole thing. <laughs> I am connected to the whole Holy Spirit, right? Well, that means you are too, right? And so in worship, when we gather, we are what? We're all connected to one another through the gathering of the Holy Spirit. And when people deeply and truly understand that, they long to what? Worship. And that really is what N.T. Wright is saying here. Worship is the recognition of who God is and how God is in the world and how God is in us, and it is our response to that. Now, there are a lot of... Uh, uh, criticisms of that in the world. There are people who say, I don't have any idea why you people go there and do that, right? I mean, if you take a, that's the next paragraph, I'm not going to read it, but what it says is that what he's saying is this, people look at the world and go, I don't, really, I don't get anything out of that. Why on earth would I spend my Sunday morning singing a bunch of old hymns and listening to somebody talk when I, I got up this morning and looked at the, at the television, the world's a wreck. <laughs> so what's all this worship, what's, what's it actually for? I mean, and who gets what out of it? Well, therein also is another problem. I want to say to you, worship isn't for you. <laughs> it's, it's our response to what God has done not a gift so that you can come and get something out of it. You get something out of it because you're in the presence of God. You don't get something because you came. So if that's the reason you're coming to worship, right is saying you're on the wrong track. You may be, he's not saying you're not Christian. He's not saying that you might not love and work hard for God, but he's saying you don't understand what worship is. To him, worship, as I said, is response. It is not a request. Worship is, as he points out, recognizing somebody is worthy of praise. Well, there was this I'm going to read. There was a time in the recent past when Western civilization took this worship of God as a given. Today, that is not the case. Widespread disbelief has replaced an almost universal belief in God that characterized American and European society. It is not surprising that many people question the point of it all. Remember I said that the churchgoers, the same percentage of people still keep going to church. But 60% don't and won't. That's a lot. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, my sister-in-law used to call me a fallen Lutheran. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow, what's interesting is when you go over to Europe, um, two of the churches that uh, were in either my family or my mm -hmm. relative's family were built in 1200 as mm -hmm. Catholic churches and then converted mm -hmm. to Lutheran. But anyhow, the liturgy is the main difference between, I think, the Baptist mm -hmm. and the Lutherans had a lot of the mm -hmm. Catholic litur liturgy and mm -hmm. still have. Mm -hmm. And and those churches, by the way, and I, I took a course, gosh, 20 years ago, it shows how old I really am, <clears throat> from a, a professor from England who taught in an English seminary. And he said at the time, 20 years ago, only 2 to 3 percent of the population of, of central London goes to church. I mean, think about that. There are these massive churches that tourists go into, and they're empty, and they're empty. You could take pictures of stuff. Well, you go back Sunday morning, and guess what? They're just as empty. Right. So we are in a period of disbelief. And what, again, part of the purpose of this chapter is, is N.T. Wright wants us to understand that worship connects us with God in a real way. Being present to prayers, being present to scripture reading, being present to taking the ordinances connects you in a way that you don't ordinarily get the rest of the week. It's not special holiness, but it can be special connection. So... In John 14, verses 15 to 17, Jesus tells the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And these are my words, that was a quote. Without the Spirit, worship does not does indeed seem pointless. I had a discussion uh, when I was leading a discussion on Scripture oh, years ago when I was actively pastoring a church. And one of the women said, well, the Bible's a holy book. You know, and I said, the Bible's a book. And it shocked her. And I said, every house in America has a Bible. Did you know that? There's a publishing study that shows that most, most households have more than one. And I'm going to let you guess which is the most popular. The King James is, uh, you got most people have a King James somewhere on a shelf, right? It's also one of the least read books in America, right? And as long as it sits up there, right, on the shelf, collecting dust, you know what it is? It's a book with a cover and pages. It's not going to affect your life at all. It's not wholly anything. It's a book with paper and words on it. What makes it holy to us? What makes it God's word? What makes it speak to us? The Holy Spirit. You can read that book like a lot of atheists do. A friend of mine is an atheist. He reads it all the time for looking, looking for ways to trap people with air. Right? It is no more holy to him uh, than a Dr. Seuss children's book. Right? But when you approach it prayerfully, what happens? The Holy Spirit... In that same chapter, actually chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John, Jesus says what? The Holy Spirit's going to open that to you. And I want to bring this in to say that's also, by the way, what happens in worship. Go ahead. John, I wanted to say that that is so clear in one's Christian journey. Um, there are all these uh, Bible verses that we read and we think we understand a certain way. And through 
through the Spirit, as you mature in your Christian journey, those passages take on different meanings, or you see them in a new mm -hmm. light. Um, and I think that can only be from the working of the Holy Spirit. And that is exactly what Jesus promised with, with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will what? Bring to your remembrance everything I said or taught, right? And there are things you can't hear now. He's talking to the disciples. But when the Spirit comes, he will what? He teach them to you. And that is still the ministry of the Spirit. Uh, so people who don't go to church don't usually start later in life, and although I'm going to say don't usually own people who came to deep faith in their 40s and 50s and never missed a Sunday until the day they died. But that's the work of the, that's the, work of the Spirit. But there's another reason for us to, to worship together, and that's in... Uh, who wants to grab Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 25? Go ahead, Linda, you got it? Hebrews 10:25. <laughs> Yeah. Somebody want to read it? Yeah. I've got the message, though. You, you might not want that, but um, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on especially as we see the big day approaching. Actually, that's a little too paraphrased for what I want to talk about. Go ahead. The uh, NIV version says, let us not give up meeting together as some of us are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay. The old King James says neglect, which is actually what the Greek says. Let us not neglect. Uh, pardon me? That's the English standard Yeah, the ESV has neglect here. And, w and the reason is we need to encourage one another, and it's in worshiping together that we grow in maturity, we grow in love for one another, we grow in fellowship, and in short, we grow as Christians. And if we neglect to do that, the cost of not worshiping isn't just simply that, you, that I don't learn some passage from a pastor. It's I'm beginning to miss out on the growth and the fellowship of being with other spirit-filled people. So that's a, an important part of, of worshiping together is, is building one another up. And... In, we're not going to read it, but if you, if you want to read that 10th chapter, the next section immediately follows is a pretty good example of what happens when you neglect to meet together. And it is a section that warns Christians, not non-Christians, by the way, of the danger of falling away from Christ. Does Christ throw you away? No. But what they're talking about is just slowly slip sliding away because you, you know, your mind, your life goes in a different direction. So worship has the function, the additional function of building us up in Christ and encouraging one another to be a Christian. And also, what does the community offer that mostly the world doesn't. You may be lucky enough to live in a neighborhood where everybody gets together all the time and supports one another. Most of us don't. And so in times of crisis, in times of trial, in times of pain, in times of loss, the Christian community, your worshiping community, can become for you 
a, a great source of comfort and support in that same Holy Spirit. So the, I want to say that Wright goes on to make a couple of important points, three about worship, and then we're going to get specifically Baptist here. Worship is not the result of an edict by an egotistical God who demands adoration. It is the response to what God has done, is doing, and will do in our lives. I hear all the time from evangelicals, we were created to worship. It makes God sound like a what? A lonely old man that needs a lot of attention, so he makes a lot of people out there to clap their hands and tell him how great he is. That's not why we were created. In Genesis, we were created to be what? Farmers, actually. <laughs> we were created to till the soil, to make it productive, to take care of it as creative agents of the God who made us. He made it. And then he looked around and said, this is sexist language because it's the King James, and there was no man to till the soil, right? And so the point was, we were meant to be what? Partners with God. We were meant to have uh, uh, some say in the rulership of the earth he put us on, and we were there to work, right? And the worship part is not why he put us here. The work part was. But the other part was, where is God when Adam and Eve sinned? In, in the Genesis story. He's walking around in the garden enjoying things, right? And interacting with both of them. And so in the last chapter of Revelation, when... The, all things are over. What is shown? What is the picture? The Garden of Eden with God, what? Walking around, talking to people, interacting with them. You know? The whole point of this long salvation trajectory is to correct the mess that was started in Eden. And to start again with a people that he can both, what, rely on and who want to be there with him. And that means people who, what, recognize who he is, what he is, what he's done, what he's doing in our lives, which leads to worship. Worship is, again, in Wright's words, and I believe it, it's the reaction to a good God, not the order of a God. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think the Bible says we were created to work. Mm -hmm. It also says work, not eat, not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, it does. <laughs> Paul tells if you're not going to work, you don't get to eat. But, so the second thing, Wright says, you become like what you worship. And I think to psychologically that's very true. It goes on to say, those who worship money become eventually human calculating machines. Those who worship sex become obsessed with their own attractiveness or prowess. Those who worship power become more and more ruthless. And it goes on, because you are made in God's image, worship makes you more truly human. Uh, so, Third, worship is at the center of Christian living. We are called to love God with our heart, mind, and strength. In worship, we go closer to God as we learn more about him and experience the fellowship of other Christians. We mature in the presence of those further along on the journey of faith. Those are the three points that he more or less ends with. Those are the reasons we should worship, and what we get out of it is a growing maturity in faith. So we're going to leave N.T. Wright for a moment, the last oh, 10, 20 minutes, and we're going to go to Baptist, specifically Baptist. Historically, Baptists have identified six elements of worship. 
These are the things we do nearly every Sunday. Now, you can have worship and not have one of these, right? But in general, these things constitute what Christian worship is. Without looking at your sheet, because <laughs> I listed them, can you tell me what they are? I think the one that comes to most people's mind first is the, you know, the songs of praise. Songs, praise. Yep. We sing. Hmm? Sermon. Prayer. Prayer. Preaching. Baptism. Lord's Supper. Yeah, what we call the ordinances. Giving. And giving. Tithing. Tithing and giving. Now, is that unique to Baptist? No. Every church, Christian church, every Christian denomination, every member of the Christian family that's, that's sort of traditionally Christian, Quakers don't do some of these things, uh, Unitarians don't, but, but every truly Christian church does every one of these things. So why do we do these things? They're not commanded, but they're all in the Bible. All of the things we do, many of them are commanded, yes. Not all of them, but many of the things that we do that aren't commanded are what? There's examples in the Bible, and there's an exhortation that we should do them. If we take them in order, prayer. Paul, I, I didn't write out the scriptures, but Paul says, I what? tell you that every time and place you should lift up holy hands, what? in prayer for everybody, <laughs> including the rulers and so forth, so that you can, what, lead a quiet life. He also says that in all times and places you should pray, what? In the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. So prayer is a fundamental part of worship, either public worship or private worship. Paul goes on to say, we should what? Encourage one another by singing songs and hymns, or rather psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And he's writing this uh, 20, 25, 30 years after the death of, of Jesus. This, so from the beginning, it was understood that the Christian community would what? Sing hymns and psalms in the first songbook was the book of Psalms. And when uh, Pliny the Younger writes a letter to Trajan saying, what are you want me to do with these two women I arrested? They were, they were accused of being Christian. And so I brought them in and tortured them, <laughs> right? And they told me this is what they do. They assemble early in the morning on a hillside and they sing songs to one Christ as to a God. And then they go back and have a small meal, which is communion, right? So from the very, very beginning, now why were they, of course, on a hillside before the sun comes up? So they wouldn't be arrested and tortured like they were. <laughs> right. So from the beginning, singing has been a part of Christian worship. Scripture reading. Uh, I just listed one, 2 Timothy 3.16, you know. But uh, about rightly dividing the word of truth, etc. But from the very beginning, even in the pre-Christian days, regular scripture reading was part of the synagogue service and it was brought over into the Christian church because the early Christians, earliest Christians were all Jews. Right. So, preaching. Again, a couple of quotes here. And, and Paul says in Romans, now how can you believe if you don't hear, and how can you hear if somebody doesn't what? Preach to you. 
But there's another piece to that, also in the synagogue service. You know, when Jesus stands up, he's given the scroll, he unrolls it from Isaiah, which is the day's reading, right? They, they were on a schedule, right? He reads it to them, and then he does what? He preaches, he delivers a sermon to them. So from the, again, from the earliest days, reading scripture and then explaining it in ways that, uh, that people, in new ways that sometimes people haven't understood or in ways that uh, they might not have heard scripture at all. And so preaching and teaching is part of Christian worship and has been from the beginning. Also, what we call the ordinances of baptism in the Lord's Supper. Other churches call them the dominical sacraments. It actually means the same thing. There's nothing wrong with the word sacrament. We just follow John Calvin. They're called dominical because both of these were instituted by who? Jesus himself. They, they weren't called from Scripture. Jesus said, what, do this in remembrance of me, so we do the Lord's Supper, and go ye into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So those are the ordinances. And then tithes and offering, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of week, lay aside a little bit as, as you feel, actually, and as you prosper. So technically... Tithing is not part of the New Testament. We get that as an example out of the old, but there is no command to tithe in the New Testament. The command is to what? Give as you're able and as you're led by the Spirit to give. But these things constitute uh, Christian worship, and they are all biblical. And whether you go, to, as I have, to an Eastern Orthodox service, the last three hours, or a Russian Orthodox service that lasts three hours, or to a high papal mass at St. Peter's, <coughs> which I have, or to Baptist or Church of Christ or uh, Pentecostal, because when I was a chaplain, I visited all these neighborhood churches and, and even went overseas and visited churches. They all have these same elements, every one. This is what we historically have determined is Christian worship. So, how do we do it? Tom Wright is an Anglican bishop. We call them Episcopal here. Right? They have a book of common prayer that's 400 years old okay, with set prayers a set liturgy, so that everybody in the world who's a member of that denomination is going to be doing the same thing on Sunday morning and gives a what? A global unity of worship. Roman Catholics do the same thing. Every Roman Catholic church on the planet is going to be reading the same scriptures on the same day and hearing a sermon about the same scriptures. We Baptists are pretty free form, right? A lot of churches follow what's called the revised common lectionary, which takes you through the entire Bible every three years. A lot of Baptists follow that because it takes you through the entire Bible every three years. And if you're a preacher, it forces you to preach on things you wouldn't ordinarily touch with a 10-foot pole, right? You look at the slaughter of the innocents the week after Christmas and go, oh, I'm not going there, yeah. <laughs> all right? So uh, these are things, but, but you go through the Bible. And uh, part of the, the world we live in is people don't read and know the Bible anymore. And so for many people, the only way they get through the Bible in a year or two years or three years is it gets read one Sunday morning. But we have a tendency to just, you know, pass, allow pastors to pick a passage. And sometimes that's a single verse. Right. And so many of our people don't really hear the Bible. And the days are over when, when you know, your 10-year-old would come home and quote long passages from Scripture because... You had to memorize them or you didn't get your gold star, right? And uh, <clears throat> we don't do that anymore. 
So worship is changing some for the better, some not. Actually, we do in Awana. Uh, in Awana, right. But not in, not in Sunday school or even in vacation Bible school the way it used to be. Okay. So why do Roman Catholics, uh, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Eastern uh, Russian Orthodox, and others have a set liturgy, a set way of doing things in a prayer book, and we don't. That this this originated long before the Roman Catholic. There was a Roman Catholic Church, hundreds of thousands, maybe thousands of years before there was a modern Roman Catholic Church. Go ahead. But John, we do, but we have the ability to do it. Um, look at Smith and Dolan's. Mm-hmm. It, that w- the autonomy of the local church. However, you struck on something that that is absolutely perfect. To kind of end this this morning, and it's this: for those of us who were not many of us uh, raised in Baptist churches and have traveled around the country, right? And have visited Baptist churches in Tennessee and California and Idaho and Michigan and Florida and here. How different are Baptist services one from another? Actually, they're almost identical. They're not, they're, we don't have to be. But I'll guarantee you, you will know the moment you walk into a Baptist church that you're where? You're in a Baptist church. And you won't have to reach down and pick up the hymnal that says Baptist hymnal on. Now, we may differ in the songs we sing. We may differ in whether or not we have a praise band or in a small Tennessee uh, mountain church that I've worshipped in an old piano, but you're going to recognize you're at Baptist Church. You know. So, and, and pretty much things are going to flow the same way, even if the, you know, you're going to have announcements. You're going to have a, a, maybe a, a little scripture passage. You're going to have an opening prayer. You're going to have an opening hymn. And, and, and if they have one, shortly thereafter, you're going to have a what? A children's service, and then you're going to have the hymn of the day, and then you're going to have a sermon, and then you're going to have a what? Altar call, we call it, and a closing prayer, and everybody's going to go home. And the music may be different, the type of music may be different, but you know what? You're going to know you're in a Baptist church. (laughs) And a huge part of that is because we all use the same resources, whether it's Smith and Helwes or... Uh, or whether it's uh, Lifeway Publishing, we all use the same thing. But the point I want to make is before we start criticizing other people's form of worship, I want to say this. (laughs) There is no uh, book of worship in the New Testament. Zero zip. 
in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, and then again in Deuteronomy, there are regulations about how a priest is to sanctify himself, how the sacrifice is to be offered, where it's to be offered, when it's to be offered, which ones are to be offered in the morning and the evening, which one is in the morning, which is only uh, uh, occasional, et cetera, et cetera. But in the New Testament, there's what? Zip. <laughs> it tells us they worshiped. And all these things that we pull out of here, the, these six things, we pulled out by reading that somebody was doing it. Right? The Lord's Supper is a good, uh, a good example. Jesus says, do this, what? As often as you do this, do this in remembrance. He doesn't say what? Do it every Sunday morning without fail. Right? Do it once a quarter. You can't do it in the middle of the week. Oh, my goodness. And a lot of Baptists would literally have a heart attack and died if they went in on Wednesday night and somebody decided to have communion. Because it's not in the Bible. Well, none of it's in the Bible. As often as you do it. Right? So we do it by convention, not because that's what was ordered. And we know that in Antioch, the church, the Christians met on the first day of the week to what? To have the Lord's Supper. It's an example. But we don't know how other people did it. So when we get to uh, talking about worship, we need to be careful not to criticize anybody else's worship style because they have the same right we do to design whatever works for them in their community, in their uh, nation, in their cultural context, in what works in their language because there's no command to do a certain way. Right. You can do it any way you want. We all around the world acknowledge these things are part of worship. But that doesn't mean they have to be done, ordered, et cetera, et cetera, that you can't have written prayers, that you can't say a creed of belief.